Last time I introduced Global Functors as the additive functors from the Global Burnside category to the category of abelian groups. I discussed some formal properties of the abelian category of Global Functors and I mentioned the main example, namely that for every orthogonal spectrum, the equivariant homotopy groups form a Global Functor in a rather tautological way. Moreover, every Global Functor arises this way even from an ironberg maclean spectrum associated to the Global Functor. The explicit examples that I discussed included the represented global functors, which are also realized by the suspension spectra of global classifying spaces, and I discussed the constant global functors. In the end, you were also supposed to check that the unreduced suspension spectrum produces free global functors that are associated with wrap functors. In the previous lectures, I discussed a lot of theory and a few examples, but not terribly many examples, so I decided to devote today's lecture to an in-depth discussion of one particular interesting example, the example that I call the global tone spectrum little m capital O. This is a specific orthogonal spectrum that is a global refinement of the non-equivariant homotopy type that's traditionally denoted by capital M capital O, which is known as the unoriented tone spectrum or unoriented bordism spectrum or real bordism spectrum, things like this. There is also a complex version or a unitary version of the entire story, the global story that I'm presenting, and there are even symplectic versions and other versions, but I will concentrate on the real story, the unoriented story in this lecture. If you have attended my traditional lecture last semester, then you have already seen this spectrum, little m capital O. In the last lecture, I concentrated on finite groups and I emphasized the connection to equivariant bordism, namely that for finite groups, the homology theory represented by little m capital O on G spectra is isomorphic to the geometrically defined homology theory given by bordism of singular G manifolds. I will repeat the statement a little bit later today, but the lecture that I'm giving today will mostly focus on global aspects of this particular orthogonal spectrum. So I personally consider MO a very interesting global homotopy type, and the reason I'm discussing it today in this lecture is that it can also serve to illustrate various features that have come up in the previous lectures. So, for example, um, the spectrum MO that I will discuss soon comes with a rank filtration with sub portions are suspensions of the global classifying spaces of the orthogonal groups. Suspensions of sigma infinity plus the global O of M. So we can use this rain filtration and the algebra of global functors to give a calculation of pi zero underlined of MO, so the zero equivalent homotopy groups, but really as a global functor, not just for the individual compact E groups. Um, another thing that this will illustrate is a slight variation. Gives another global tom spectrum. That I denote by capital M, capital O, and this would in the printed sources be boldface, um, and that is non-equivalent equivalent to little m capital O. But it's globally different, actually very different. So this is a very naturally occurring example that doesn't have to be crafted artificially, where you can see the difference between non-equivalent stable equivalents and global equivalents. 
I would like to begin the discussion of this spectrum with an unstable global object, namely the one that the, capital, the little n capital O is really the tome spectrum over, and I denote this unstable global object by little b capital O. So here is the definition. This is an unstable global object, so it's an orthogonal space. The orthogonal space b o has values, so it has to be a functor from finite dimensional inner product spaces, so I have to tell you what its value at an inner product space v is. And this is just the Grossmannian of v-dimensional subspaces of v plus r infinity. So this bars around the v means the dimension of v. I have to give you the structure maps. So here is a linear isometric embedding. Phi from B to W. And this induces the continuous map that I write phi lower star from B of, of V to B of W. And this is given as follows. So I have to apply phi lower star to an element in the source. So this is a subspace of V plus R infinity of the same dimension as V. And the first thing you would like to do is you take phi direct sum R infinity and you apply it to L. This would be the natural thing to try. But then you notice that the dimensions don't work out. You know, there's, it's perfectly possible that W has a larger dimension than V whereas this will still have the dimension of v, so this doesn't quite match up. So what we're doing is we're adding to this w minus phi of v. So this is the orthogonal complement of the image of phi in w. Direct sum 0, so this sits in w in the w sum end and 0 in the r infinity sum end. And this is the end of the definition, and it's important to observe that this summit is orthogonal to this summit because here we're taking something in the image of phi and this is orthogonal to the image of phi. So in particular, the dimensions exactly work out and this thing together has the same dimension as w, so it is an element in B O of w. So this is continuous in phi also, not just continuous in L, so it defines a continuous functor altogether and that's the end of the definition of B O. So this orthogonal space, as the notation suggests, is an unstable global refinement of what's usually called DO, the classifying space of the infinite orthogonal group. Capital letter here of the O, where O is the co-limit of the union of the OMs, is the infinite orthogonal group. And at this point, and also later, I'm including OM into OM plus 1 via a group homomorphism that I denote IM in the standard way. So in terms of matrices, we're sending A to the matrix A001. And if you think in terms of isometries of real vector spaces, then this is adding on the right the identity of a single copy of R. So why is the little bo a global refinement of this? Well, first of all, these structure maps are all closed embeddings, so we're talking about an orthogonal space where the underlying homotopy type can be identified by just evalu evaluating it at r infinity. And so B O of r infinity is a non-equivalent homotopy type that this represents, and this is a co-limit as m close to infinity of B O of R to the M by definition. 
Uh, if we evaluate an orthogonal space on something infinite dimensional, it's the co-limit over the finite dimensional sub-representations. And now here we're in including the rm into the next rm plus 1 by adding a 0 in the last coordinate. And if I don't say anything, this will always be how we consider smaller rms as subspaces of larger rms. And what is this? So this is a co-limit over m of a Grassmannian of m planes in rm plus r infinity. Here I'm just expanding the definition little bo. And this is a classifying space for the group BOM, the Grassmannian of M planes in, well, this is just an R infinity, slightly differently, slightly uh, unusually written. So this is a co-limit along closed embeddings of classifying spaces of BOM. And to complete the identification, you should convince yourself that if here we go from one M to the next one, that the map on classifying spaces is really classifying this homomorphism between the groups. The orthogonal space little m capital O is a global refinement of the classifying space of the infinite orthogonal group. But we can also identify the global homotopy type of this object in terms of things that have already come up. For this purpose, I will introduce a filtration that I'll call the rank filtration, mostly for lack of better name, and that will also have a stable analog for the tome spectrum little m capital O later. So here's how this goes. So I define certain closed orthogonal subspaces, B O M, B O little m of V, and I simply take the Grassmannian of V dimensional subspaces in V plus. Rm. And as before, I'm considering Rm as a subvector space of R infinity by filling up with zeros on the right. So this sits inside R of Bo m plus 1 then, and we get an ascending sequence Bo0. So what is Bo0? Then we're looking at v dimensional subspaces of v. There's exactly one of these, namely v itself. So that's a point. So the Bo0 is. The terminal orthogonal space, it's a constant one point orthogonal space. This sits inside BO1 and so on. And then this sits inside BOM. And the whole thing, BO, is a union along these closed orthogonal subspaces and greater or equal to zero BOM. As I shall now explain, the little BOM is a global homotopy type that we have already seen. For this, I need a little bit of technology about unstable global homotopy theory that's useful to know anyhow. So let me write this down as a theorem and then give you a reference, but not a proof for it. So let x be an orthogonal space. W an inner product space, finite dimensional, and then I'll define a shift by W of this orthogonal space. So the W shift of X is the following composite. So an orthogonal space is a functor on the linear isometries category. And I just precompose with the self functor of the linear symmetries category that adds a copy of W, and then I'll take the X. So this defines it as a functor, and then in particular, if I look at the value of X shifted by W at V, so this is the original X at V plus W. So this was just a definition, and now comes the theorem part. And the theorem part says that the maps x of i v from x of v to x of v plus w form a global equivalence of orthogonal spaces.
So IV denotes the inclusion of V into V plus W as the first summit. This is exactly the value of the shifted space at uh, V. So this is a morphism of orthogonal spaces from X to the shift of X by W. And this is a global equivalence. I don't want to prove this for you, but here is a reference. So now we return to the rank filtration of BO, and I'm going to apply this now. So let's look at BOM at V, which was by definition the Grassmannian of V planes in V plus RM. So we have inner products, Euclidean inner products around, so a subspace has an orthogonal complement. If I take a v-dimensional subspace of this and look at its complement, I exactly get an m-dimensional subspace. So this is homeomorphic by taking orthogonal complements to the Grossmannian of m planes in v plus r m. And this is exactly the value of the global classifying space of om at V plus Rn. So here I'm going to introduce a convention that I will remain in force throughout the entire lecture. The definition of a global classifying space always involved a choice of a faithful representation. And whether I'm going to look at a global classifying space for the group OM, I'm going to take the most obvious faithful representation that at least I can think of, namely the tautological representation on Rm, the defining representation. So that's always the implicit choice when I talk about the global classifying space of OM. And as I explained in the previous lecture, with this choice of facial representation, the functor BGLOM is simply taking uh, the Grassmannian of M planes in something. So that's actually not quite an equality, but it's a pretty canonical isomorphism. Here we have shifted by RM. So this is the shift M, which is an abbreviation for shift by RM of the global classifying space OM at V. Now, this identification was a homeomorphism for every V, and now you should check that this is compatible with the structure maps, so it's actually an isomorphism of orthogonal spaces. So VOM of V is isomorphic to the shift by RM of the global classifying space of OM, and as I explained in this theorem, this receives a global equivalence from the global classifying space of OM. So that means that the nth piece in the rank filtration is up to global equivalence, an object that we've already seen. It is a global classifying space of the orthogonal. And so we can informally summarize this that by saying that the O is globally a homotopy colimit as n ranges over the non-negative integers of the global classifying spaces of OM. So I should explain this a little bit. Um, this filtration is by closed subspaces, and uh, these are all closed orthogonal spaces, so that means if we want to understand the k-homotopy type, of BO, we can evaluate it at a complete K universe. And there again, we have this filtration by closed K invariant subspaces. And a sequential, uh, if you exhaust a K space by a sequence of closed K subspaces, then this is always a homotopy colibit in the category of K spaces. So this is pointwise by evaluating at complete universes a homotopy colimit, and that basically means that it's also globally a homotopy colimit. For this to be really useful, we should also understand the tradition maps, and I will give away the secret already. The tradition maps are essentially induced by applying B global to this block sum embeddings between the orthogonal groups that I've previously mentioned. And on the next whiteboard, I'll give one precise statement, uh, which is the effect on the equivalent homotopy set functors, the red functors unstable. As we just showed, the maps that send a subspace to its orthogonal complement 
in constitute a global equivalence from the global classifying space of the nth orthogonal group based on the tautological representation in Rm to the nth piece in the ring filtration of BO. Previously, we've showed that the morphism of rep functors from the repre represented rep functor by the orthogonal group to pi zero underlined of the global classifying space of OM is an isomorphism. So this was nothing special about the orthogonal group. This was true and more generally for arbitrary compact Lie groups. Now we combine this with this global equivalence and the fact that global equivalences induce isomorphisms on the rep functors, pi zero equivalent homotopy sets, and we get the following corollary. The morphism of rep functors from the rep functor represented by OM to pi zero underlined of the nth filtration in the brain filtration. And which one am I looking at? The one that is classified by the class of the OM fixed point zero plus Rm in BOM of Rm, which is the Grassmannian of M planes in two copies of Rm, is an isomorphism. A uh, few comments about this. So first of all, what I mean by the morphism of rep functors classified by? Well, this is a represented functor, so the unit dilemma tells us to give a morphism of rep functors out of something. We just have to specify where the universal element, in other words, the identity of OM, goes. So we have to specify an element in pi zero OM equivariant of this. And I do this by telling you, giving you an OM fixed points of the value of this orthogonal space. This has to be a B, I'm sorry. The value of this orthogonal space at the tautological OM representation Rm, and I take the second copy 0 plus Rm in Rm plus Rm. So what is the proof of this? The proof of this is you know we combine this isomorphism of rep functors with the one induced by the global equivalence, and we just check, you know, this was given by evaluation at the tautological class. The tautological class corresponds to the unique point Rm in the Grassmannian of Rm plus Rm that is embedded here as the first copy and then taking the orthogonal complement so it becomes the second copy of Rm. There's one important word of warning at this point. Um, I'm looking here at the Grassmannian of M planes in Rm plus Rm, but these two Rms play very different roles and if I'd been really careful I should have introduced different pieces of notation for them. The first copy of the Rm used to be a V, really, and that's why the orthogonal group O of M acts through its action on the tautological representation. The second copy of Rm is really there because it was a subspace of R infinity on which the structure maps of the orthogonal space BO do not act. This R infinity was sort of constant in the global direction, and this Rm is just a piece of that. So that means the action of the mth orthogonal group on this Grassmannian is only through the first summit of Rm and not diagonally through the other summits. So if I had been a little bit more formal and more careful, I would have called these two summits different names to make this more obvious, but I guess now I warned you about this, and now you can be careful. So this is the end of the warning. Good, so now we understand uh, the pieces of the rank filtration, and for this to be really useful, we should understand the tradition maps. Ideally, we should understand the tradition maps as morphisms of global spaces, Secretly, global classifying spaces are again have a representability property and we really only have to understand what morphisms out of them do on the universal classes in pi zero uh, OM in this particular example. And the next proposition will tell you what the transition map from the global classifying space of one orthogonal group to the next does on the universal class. So here's a proposition.
the following diagram of red functors commutes. So here I take the red functor represented by OM. Here I take this particular isomorphism that I specified in the corollary, 2 pi 0 underlined of, I keep saying MO, but it's BOM. Here I go to the red functor blank OM plus 1. Here I use the morphism of global functors that I call by IM a slight abuse of notation. So IM, remember, was the homomorphism from OM to OM plus 1, which is block sum with the identity matrix in the lower right corner. I use the same symbol for the induced morphism of red functors by post composition in that variable. So here I have another instance of the isomorphism of the corollary, but now for N plus 1 instead of M. This goes to pi 0 underlined of B O M plus 1. And here I have the inclusion and whatever it induces, because this is after all an orthogonal subspace of this. So this is a justification, at least on the level of rep functors of zero-dimensional equivalent homotopy sets, that the transition maps really are, you apply global classifying spaces to this homomorphism that I called IM from OM into OM plus 1. So I'll prove this on the next whiteboard. To prove the proposition, we first of all appeal to the unit dilemma. After all, we want to show an equality between two natural transformations where the source is a representative functor, and the unital lemma tells us we only have to check this on the universal class. And the universal class is the identity of OM in the category where and now we're going to substitute the definitions and then we'll see that we really have to show the following relation. So on the one side the identity went to the class represented by 0 plus r to the m and then we did we applied the inclusion from b o m to b o m plus 1 and on the other hand we first took 0 plus r to the m plus 1. This is what the morphism from rep into O m plus 1 to the 0 equivalent homotopy functor of B O m plus 1 classifies. And then we have to do I and R star. To this. And this is how the morphism from a represented functor works. And if you want, if you're willing to confuse the difference between the group OM and its image in OM plus 1, if you're willing to consider OM as a subgroup, then you could also think of this informally as restriction from OM plus 1 to OM of this class 0 plus RM plus 1. And this equality we have to show in pi 0 OM of B OM plus 1. So we want to show an equality between these two classes. Um, if we were extremely lucky, this would be represented in the same OM representation, but they're actually not, because this representative here, this lies in BOM of RM, the value of the topological representation. And the whole thing, if we apply the inclusion to this, this is represented uh, by BOM plus 1 of RM. Whereas this thing inside lives in B O M plus 1 of R M plus 1. And then the whole thing lives in the restriction from O M plus 1 to O M of B O M plus 1 of R M plus 1. So the two classes, the representatives that they come with, don't live in the same representation 
of the group OM. One of them lives in the tautological representation, and the other one lives in the restriction of the tautological representation of the Lex larger group restricted down to OM. So this representation, of course, splits into a copy of the tautological and the trivial one-dimensional representation. So how are we going to compare this and show that these two classes are equal? Well, we're going to use an invariance property that we showed a little bit earlier. Some time ago, I showed that if you have a linear equivariant linear isometric embeddings of G representations, then you can push forward a representative rep over the source representation along the induced map uh, by the orthogonal space you're considering to the target representation, and they will represent the same classes in the codec. So we apply this to, we use the OM equivariant linear isometric embedding that I'll call phi from RM, which is the tautological OM representation, to the restriction from OM plus 1 to OM of the tautological representation of the next larger group, and I mean the same one that I've used before, where we're putting a zero in the very last slot. So this is the inclusion, you know, this splits up as two summits, and it's the inclusion of the first summit. So now I can take the effect on BO of this representative. So if I do phi lower star applied to this representative, to zero plus Rm, what do I get? Well, now we have to remember how the structure maps in BO worked, and the structure maps they added the orthogonal complement of the linear isometric embedding, so in this case the last R summit, but to the first copy of the two. So this is actually the representative of 0 plus R plus Rm plus 0, to be very precise, sitting inside R to the M plus 1 plus R to the M plus 1. And now we see that this representative is not the same as the other representative, because in the other one, this r would be at the very end. Uh, here, r equals 1, so it's not the same representative. Uh, what saves us, though, is that we only have to show that they are in the same path component of the OM fixed points. And luckily, the two subspaces, 0 plus r plus r to the m plus 0, and 0 plus r to the m plus 1 lie in the same path component of which space of b o m plus 1 at the restriction from o m plus 1 to o m of r m plus 1. In down-to-earth terms, this was the Grassmannian of m plus 1 planes in r to the m plus 1 plus r to the m plus 1. And what saves us here is that we really only have to look at the om fixed points and not the om plus 1 fixed points. And the om action is only on the first rm here. And with respect to that action, they lie in the same fixed point. If for some reason we had to consider om plus 1 fixed points here, then we would have a problem. But that's not what we need to show. We have to show a relation in om. And so everything works out, and this proves the relation. This is the end of the proof. So I will now use this to calculate the rep functor of the zero equivariant homotopy sets of BO, because now we understand this for each term in the ring filtration, and we understand the transition map, so we basically only have to pass to the coordinate. The calculation of the homotopy rep functor of BO will be in terms of real representation rings. Now I let G be a compact E group. Now we define a map from the zeroth G equivariant homotopy set of BO to R O G, so this is the real representation ring of G. So the group and deep group of finite dimensional representations of the compact Lie group G over the real numbers. Okay, how does the definition work? So we take the class 
represented by some L in here. So L must be a G fixed point of the value of BO at some G representation. The some G representation. And it has to be a G fixed point in there. So what was this? So this was the Resonantian of V dimensional subspaces of V plus R infinity, and then fixed points of that. The G action on this is through its action on V, and then the functoriality made was so that the G really only permutes the V and it doesn't do anything with the R infinity. So, what it means to have such a fixed point is we have a G invariant sub vector space of V plus R infinity of the same dimension as V. So we can get an element in the representation ring by just, we could send L to the class of L in the representation ring, but this wouldn't work out with the stabilization process. So what we really want to do is we want to send this to V minus L, the class of V in the representation ring minus the class of L in the representation ring. We could do this L minus V instead, we would get the sort of negative homomorphism. That's the choice that we have, so let me agree to do it v minus n here. So now the, there's a bunch of things to check. So the first thing to check is that if you take a different L in this fixed point set, but in the same path component, that you get the same result in the end. And this is uh, the fact that representations of compact Lie groups cannot vary in families. So if you have something in the same path component, then it's isomorphic as a G representation to the L. The next thing to check is that if you increase the V via a linear isometric embedding, that you get the same difference in the real representation ring. And there, the way we have defined the structure maps in BO will come up again, because you increase this along linear isometric embedding from V into W, then you know V gets replaced by W, but also L gets replaced by V plus the orthogonal complement of the image. And if you unravel all the definitions, this difference is exactly what stays constant in stabilization. So this is a set theoretically well-defined map, and you can work out that this is actually a homomorphism of abelian monoids. This is a homomorphism of abelian monoids, where on the target we even have an abelian group, it's the Grotendi group after all. So why do we have an abelian monoid structure here, which on the source comes from an infinity structure of BO, which on the source arises from an infinity structure of BO. So as I mentioned earlier, in general, these pi zero upper g in the unstable context are just sets and they have no additional structure. However, if the orthogonal space has additional structure, then this might inherit extra operations. And this particular orthogonal space has an infinity structure. I'm not going to go into details here, but I'll give you a reference where you can look this up. If I had more time and if I were to focus on multiplicative aspects of the theory, I would at this point also comment that this is a naturally occurring example that illustrates the difference between E-infinity structures and what I call ultra-commutative structures. So the E-infinity structures are less structured than the ultra-commutative ones. For example, they don't have finite index transfers. But again, I'm not going to elaborate on this in this lecture, and I'll just give the references for that. So now the main point is that this map that I've just defined lets us identify what this is in terms of the real representation ring. And the theorem is as follows. For every compact D group G, the homomorphism of abelian monads that I've written up there from pi zero G of BO to ROG is injective, and we can say what its image is. Its image consists of all classes of the form class of W minus the dimension of W in ROG. 
for all gene representations W. So what I mean by, so brackets W is the class of the representation in the representation ring. Dimension W stands for the trivial representation of the same dimension of W. So R to the dimension of W with a trivial action. As you will clearly see is that all these classes are actually contained in the, represent, in the augmentation idea. So note the image is contained in the augmentation idea. So all the classes have virtual dimension zero, which is immediate from this description, but also here because L and V have the same dimension. And the next thing that you might want to check is that the image is a free abelian monoid. Which doesn't have inverses. With a basis, the classes of the form lambda minus dimension of lambda for all non-trivial irreducible representations up to isomorphism. Non-trivial irreducible G representations. Lambda will one each isomorphism class. So because this is an abelian monoid, which as soon as the group is non-trivial, doesn't have inverses, it's not an abelian group. This also shows that this little DO is not a group-like object in this global context. The underlying non-equivalent homotopy type is an E infinity space that's path connected, so in particular it's automatically group-like. But this particular global refinement is not group-like, otherwise we would have to get abelian groups here. So let me just briefly sketch how the proof goes, and the proof really uses this identification. So we go over the co-limit m greater or equal to zero of the rep functors blank O m. I have previously given you an isomorphism from this rep functor for an individual m to the pi zero underlined of B O m. This is the co-limit over m. So now these are all closed embeddings and equivalent homotopy sets commute with sequential co-limits over closed embeddings, again because you know, we're mapping in points and intervals and these are compact and so they land in some kind of stage. So this is um, pi zero underlined of BO. And now the only thing left is to work out what the maps in this co-limit system do and that I leave to you as an exercise. I've given you explicitly on the previous slide what the map of rep functors in the transition maps do, and so it's a al purely algebraic exercise to work out that you get this answer up to isomorphism. This is the end of the unstable global considerations, at least for today, and now I'm going to atomify the discussion. Definition. The value of the global Tom spectrum little m capital O it's going to be an orthogonal spectrum at an inner product space V is the following m O of V is the Tom space of the tautological bundle of the Grassmannian of V planes in V plus R infinity. So I'll often use a slightly sloppy notation when I write tom off. Then I always have a situation where there's a tautological bundle over this space in mind that I'm suppressing from the notation. Of course, you cannot take a tom space just of a base space, you need some bundle. But I use this notation when there's a tautological bundle around, like here the tautological dim V plane bundle over this Grassmannian. And this is by definition the tom space of the tautological bundle over VO of V. There's an isomorphic description that's also sometimes useful. I could look at the linear isometric embeddings from V into V plus R infinity. 
So if I took a quotient space of this by the action of the orthogonal group of V on the source, I would get the grass menu. And to get the Tom space, I added this joint base point and smash over all V with the V sphere, where this acts by precomposition here and tautologically here there. So that would be an isomorphic description. This is an orthogonal spectrum, so I should tell you what the structure maps are, and I'm going to give you the structure maps in this description. So the structure maps have to be continuous map for all inner product spaces V and W from O of VW. So this was my notation for the indexing category for orthogonal spectra. This was the tom spaces of the orthogonal complement bundles. And I have to give you a map for M O of W. The point in here is either the base point, or if it's not the base point, it's of the form phi, which is a linear isometric embedding from V into W and a point little w. This is a point in the orthogonal complement of the image of phi. And you smash this with a point in here. A point here is an x comma l, where l is a v-dimensional subspace of v plus r infinity, and x is a point in l. And I'm sending this to w comma zero plus phi plus r infinity apply to x. So this is a vector in w plus r infinity. This lies in something orthogonal to that. And I need a subspace in the end, and that's just the bar phi lower star applied to L. So this was the structure map in the orthogonal space BO that I'm applying to the L. So this not only took the image under phi plus r infinity, it also added the orthogonal complement of the image of phi. And it's not particularly difficult to check that this is continuous in all the relevant variables and it's a functor so we have defined an orthogonal spectrum. So here's a bunch of remarks about this. First of all, I want to explain that this really refines the well-known classical non-equivariant homotopy type that's usually denoted by a capital M capital O, which is called the unoriented Tom spectrum or the unoriented bordism spectrum or the real bordism spectrum or something like this. This follows from a bunch of observations. First of all, the space um, Grassmannian of M planes in R of M plus R infinity. So this is BO of RM, as we already remarked a little bit earlier, is a classifying space of OM for the group O of M. And the space MO of R of M is the tom space of the tautological bundle over this. It's the tom space of the tautological, by definition, tautological M plane bundle over this particular model for BOM. And the traditional notation for this that's often used is MO of M. That's often how this tone space of the tautological bundle over BOM is defined. And then if you check what the structure map is, so the structure map for a particular instance of the structure map, that's a map from MO at RM smash S1. M or uh, M plus 1 is the effect on Tom spaces of the splitting of the tautological bundle, tautological M plus 1 plane bundle. Over BO M plus 1 upon restriction along the map B of the homomorphism IM from BOM to BOM plus 1. So this is to connect with the 
traditional sources and references where usually only a homotopy type of spectrum is needed and not some orthogonal spectrum or anything fancy and then you often, traditionally you would just give a sequence of spaces and then connecting maps from the suspension of one space to the next and then you know, this tom space would be the nth space and the structure map would exactly come from the fact that if you pull back the tautological n plus one plane bundle to BOM along the block sum embedding then it splits off a line bundle and on tom spaces this becomes a suspension. So MO is really a global equivalent refinement of what's traditionally called MO. Last semester, I explained the proof of the following result, which is due to Wasserman. The GB a finite group. And A base GCW complex. Then the Tompontiarian construction equivalent one so this is a map from n star g of a to m o star g of a which I define as the G equivalent homotopy groups of the orthogonal spectrum MO smashed with the G space A. And this has a G action coming only from the A. The O is something global, it doesn't have a G action, but it comes from this A. And this is from the geometric bordism groups. This side this is a really geometrically defined theory. Elements in dimension M are represented by smooth closed G manifolds equipped with a reference map that's a continuous G map to the spaced G space A. Um, then you have to reduce it because that's based. So I guess I should have the tilde here for the reduced theory. And then these uh, singular G manifolds, as they're called, are considered up to a bordism relation. And I explained all these terms last semester, and I gave a proof of why this is an isomorphism. To me personally, this is a very strong motivation for being interested in this global tome spectrum little and uh, capital O. Uh, and I think it's a very good reason for wanting to study it also from a global perspective. It's an interesting insight that there's one global theory who represents all these equivalent homology theories. I'm hoping that there are some people watching still the videos at this point that haven't been to the class last term. So for those people, I want to provide a couple of references where you can look this up. So first of all, there's Wassermann's original paper. Well, in that paper, you don't find the statement in the form that I've written it up. Wassermann actually proves an equivariant differential topological result that is an equivariant refinement of Witness strong embedding theorem. So Mostow and Palais had earlier proved that the smooth closed G-manifold can always be embedded into a G-representation, into a linear representation. And Wassermann has a refinement for that which gives a bound on how large the representation has to be in terms of equivariant tang tangential data of the G-manifold. I had a little bit of a hard time translating the results in Wassermann's paper into this homotopical statement. I know one reference, unfortunately unpublished, where this transition is also written up, and this is in the unpublished part of Kostanovel's thesis. If you're more homotopically inclined rather than geometric differentially inclined, then there is a proof of this theorem in a paper by Tom Deek, where, is, where the proof is really by isotro isotropy separation, identifying the geometric fixed points and reducing it to the classical non-equivalent statement. Finally, I have written up a version of this theorem in the Global Homotopy Theory book, so there's also a reference here, and there's actually a more general, because there is something you can prove beyond the class of finite groups. The same construction, equivalent tom Tomponriagin construction, is actually an isomorphism more generally for all compact Lie groups that are isomorphic to a product of a finite group and a torus, and you can find an argument in Global Homotopy Theory in this generality. 
I should warn you that the map is still defined, but probably not an isomorphism beyond the class of compact Lie groups that are isomorphic to finite times torus. For example, in SU2, there's an explicit class in the homotopical theory that doesn't come from the geometric theory. This was more background, and today I wanted to focus on global equivalent features of the MO theory, but you should always keep this in mind as an important piece of motivation. The rank filtration for little b capital O that I have discussed in the first half of the class has a stable analog, and that's going to be useful to us. So here's the rank filtration for MO. So I define a filtration by orthogonal subspectra, closed orthogonal subspectra. So the value of MOM at V is the tom space of the Grassmannian of V-dimensional subspaces in V plus Rm. So in other words, it's the tom space of the topological M-plane bundle over BOM of V in the notation that I've defined earlier. So the structure maps restrict the structure maps of MO restrict to these subspaces to MOM, giving an exhaustive sequence sequence of closed orthogonal subspectra. sitting inside MO1, sitting inside MOM, and everything is sitting inside MO, and this is the union of this filtration. So what's the zeroth piece? As I noted before, the space BO0 of V is just a single point because we're looking at V-dimensional subspaces in V, and there's only V itself. The topological vector bundle over this single point is V, and its one-point compactification is the sphere of V, so this actually turns out to be the sphere spectrum. There is an E-infinity multiplication on this orthogonal spectrum that, again, I don't want to talk about here, but the inclusion of the zeroth piece into the whole thing is also the unit of the ring structure. And then, similarly, as in the unstable case, MO is really globally a homotopy colimit, of these filtrations. So basically, what you need to make this precise is the fact that this is a filtration which exhausts everything and it is by closed subspectra. And then you know equivalences are tested on equivariant homotopy groups where you're mapping compact things into, uh, into test spaces and anything compact mapping into a sequential co-limit of closed embeddings lands in some finite stage. So that's basically the justification that this is a homotopy coordinate. So if we want to understand this MO, we might want to study it by going up this filtration. And then if we want to inductively understand this, we should understand the sub quotients of the filtration. Here's another thing that I will just say without proof. These inclusions of one of the filtration pieces into the next one, they're very nice homotopically. More precisely, at an inner product space V, these are O of V equivariant H cofibrations. This is a technical property which is extremely useful because it means that if we take the actual points at level quotients of these orthogonal spectra, that these have the same global homotopy type as the mapping telescope, uh, as the mapping cone, I'm sorry. And of course, for the mapping cone of any map, we would have long exact sequences of equivariant homotopy groups. If you put this globally, we would get long exact sequences of global functors of homotopy groups. And the fact that these inclusions are so nice means that also for MOM minus 1 sitting inside MOM and then the actual quotient, we get long exact sequences of homotopy groups either individually at one compact Lie group or altogether as global functors. I will use that without further comment on the next whiteboard. This theorem identifies the subquotients of the rank filtration. The nth subquotient, so the nth piece modulo the n minus first piece, is globally equivalent to the m-fold suspension 
of the unreduced suspension spectrum of the global classifying space of OM. This result has certainly been known for a long time in the non-equivalent context, and possibly also equivalently, but I think it's very interesting that this holds in this very rigid form as an equivalence of global stable homotopy types. I want to give a sketch proof of this, meaning I will not completely formalize all the parts, but I'll give you all the main arguments that I need. First, I have to remind you of a shift construction that is the stable analog of the shift by an inner product space that came up in the first part of this lecture. So the nth shift, shift mx of an orthogonal spectrum x, is the following composite. So after all, an orthogonal spectrum is a based continuous functor from the indexing category O to the category of based spaces. So when we, if we precompose with a based continuous functor, we get another orthogonal spectrum. And here we have a functor that I want to suggestively write as direct sum of R to the M. So on the level of objects, it just sends B to V orthogonal direct sum with R to the M. And on the level of morphisms, the morphism is a vector and a linear isometric embedding such that the vector is orthogonal to the image of a linear isometric embedding. And this simply goes to W0, comma, phi plus R to the M. So in particular, the shift Mx evaluated at an inner product space V is the original X evaluated at V plus Rm. Another thing that I want to use is that up to global equivalence, shifting is just suspending. So more precisely, the opposite structure maps assemble into a global equivalence that I, if I need a notation, I would call it lambda and x. And it goes from x smash with this m, so this is the pointwise smash product of the m sphere, to shift m of x. So after all, if I plug in an inner product space v, here I get x of v smash as m, and here I get x of v direct sum r to the m, and the opposite structure map is exactly a map that goes there. And it's really a fact about equivalent stable homotopy theory for one compact Lie group at a time that this is a pi star isomorphism of orthogonal G spectra for every G and hence a global equivalence. So here's a reference for this basic fact that we need. Good, armed with this shifting construction, we now get a stable isomorphism that's again an analog of an unstable isomorphism that I proved in the first part of the lecture. So let's look at M or M again. By definition, this was the Tom space over the Grassmannian of V planes in V plus Rm. And I claim that this is homeomorphic to O, let me make a little blackboard O here, R to the M, V plus R to the M, modulo O of M. So this is a space in the indexing category for orthogonal spectra, the Tom space of the orthogonal complement bundle. And I'm dividing out the O of M action on the source, which is also the automorphism group here. The homeomorphism is most easily described by going from the right to the left. So elements in here are O M orbits of pairs x, phi. Phi is a linear isometric embedding from Rm into V plus Rm. And the square brackets mean that we're taking O M orbits. And I'm going to send this to the pair consisting of the same vector. But then I take the image of phi and then its orthogonal complement. So here x is in the orthogonal complement of the image, and in this Tom space it has to be inside of the subspace, so that exactly is fixed by taking phi of Rm and then its orthogonal complement. This is a homeomorphism for every inner product space V, and if we let the V vary, this gives us an isomorphism of orthogonal spectra. Uh, 
where on the one hand side we have the nth piece in the rank filtration, and on the other hand, we basically have the represented functor modulo OM, but here's another R to the M, so that's exactly the shift. So here we have shift M, and then we have O of R to the M blank modulo O of M. Using this fact that shifting is globally equivalent to suspending, we get out that this is globally equivalent to SM smash the represented orthogonal spectrum modulo OM. The nth piece in the ring filtration is globally an m fold suspension of another orthogonal spectrum, namely of the orthogonal spectrum represented by Rm and then modded out by the tautological OM action on this variable we're mapping out of. Now we can apply the same argument to m minus 1 instead of m, and then we get that this is globally equivalent. And I just copy this with m minus 1 instead of m. Now, this is globally equivalent to something else, namely to S n minus 1 smash S1 smash O of Rm blank modulo O n minus 1. So, what has happened here? This has remained the same. I've added an additional copy of S1 and I've enlarged the air, uh, this m minus 1 to an m, but I'm still dividing out by the o m minus 1 action. So what has changed is this extra s1, and the r m minus 1 has become an rm. So this is the stable analog of the fact that the global classifying space doesn't change if you replace um, faithful representation by a larger one. So this is a faithful o m minus 1 representation. This is a larger faithful o m minus 1 representation. The map really goes from here to here, it's a restriction map. If these were spaces of linear isometric embeddings without the S1, this is something we have previously discussed, it's an unstable global equivalence. And this is the stable analog, and because we're in the stable situation, the orthogonal complement direction gives you another S1 here. So there's a global stable equivalence going in this direction. This we can rewrite up to isomorphism in a slightly different way. So first of all, we call, we collect the suspension coordinates together, and then I do O of Rm blank, the represented orthogonal functor, smash over Om, and then I do Om modulo Om minus 1 with a disjoint base point. So the difference between here and here is the homeomorphism that cancels the out the Om here. Um, so we see that we get two very similar global descriptions for the mth and the m minus first piece in the ring filtration. Both have Sm smash something and O out of Rm over Om something. So we put this together now. We look at the quotient of M O M modulo M O M minus 1. So because of this H cofibrancy condition that we have level-wise, I already mentioned that the strict quotient is globally equivalent to the mapping cone. And in the mapping cone, that's a homotopy invariant construction. Anyhow, we can replace objects by globally equivalent objects. So this is globally equivalent to the mapping cone of SM smash O of RM blank smash over OM Om modulo Om minus 1 plus going to Sm smash O of Rm blank modulo Om. Then there's something to check, namely under all these identifications, some of which I haven't even made completely explicit, that the inclusion corresponds to the map here, which doesn't do anything on the Sm and on here, and it just projects this orbits space OM modulo OM minus 1 to the point. If you believe this is under the unspecified identifications, that's what's happening, then this is homeomorphic. You know, this is a co limit type construction. We can pull the smashing outside and this balanced product outside. So this will be homeomorphic to SM smash O of RM blank balanced product over OM. And now we can get the cone. 
And this is a map of based OM spaces, the homogeneous space OM modulo OM minus 1 with a disjoint base point and then going to S0. This is the reduced mapping column. The next observation is that OM modulo OM minus 1 is OM equivalently isomorphic to the unit sphere in RM. And if we take the mapping cone, the unreduced mapping cone of the unit sphere in some representation going to the point, we get the one point compactification. So this whole mapping cone is OM equivalently homeomorphic to the one point compactification of RM. So we get that this is homeomorphic to SM smash O of RM blank smash over OM with SM. The next ingredient is again something general, it's called the untwisting homeomorphism that has to do with the fact that these orthogonal complement bundles become trivial by definition if we stabilize them or take direct sum of the source representation. So more precisely, untwisting isomorphisms, they go as follows, so we have two inner product spaces V and W. Then we can look at the total space of the orthogonal complement bundle, which in the very first lecture I denoted by psi v, w cross v. And this is isomorphic as a vector bundle over the linear isometric embeddings from v to w to the space of linear isometric embeddings v plus w cross w. So in here, an element is a w, phi where W is orthogonal to the complement of the image. And then we have a vector V, and we send this to the linear isometric embedding phi, and then we take W plus phi of V. This is an isomorphism of vector bundles over the space of linear isometric embeddings from V plus W. Now we can take this vector bundle isomorphism and pass to tom spaces. And when we pass to Tom spaces on this side, we get O of VW smash SV is homeomorphic to the space of linear isometric embeddings BW with a disjoint base point smash SW. And now we can let the W run and keep the V fixed. If we keep the V fixed and let the W run, then this becomes the represented orthogonal spectrum smashed with SV, and the right-hand side becomes the suspension spectrum of the disjoint base point of the space linear isometric embeddings blank. So this is an isomorphism of orthogonal spectrum. In this isomorphism, the orthogonal group of V acts, um, and it acts here diagonally on the two copies, and here it only acts on this copy. That's what happens under this untwisting homeomorphism. So now we specialize this to V equals Rm, and we take orbits under the O of M action. So then the left-hand side becomes O of Rm blank smash over Om with Sm, which is exactly this part in the previous identification. And we get an isomorphism of orthogonal spectra with sigma infinity plus of L of Rm blank modulo Om, and this is the unreduced suspension spectrum of the global classifying space of Om. So now let's put everything together, and then we get the desired result, and let me put this up here. On the one hand side, we had identified Mom modulo Mom minus 1 up to global equivalence, with this expression, with the m-fold suspension of the represented orthogonal spectrum smashed over OM with SM. And then this second part we have identified with the suspension spectrum of the global classifying space of OM. So we get another global equivalence to SM smash sigma infinity plus B global OM. So this is the end of the identification of the sub quotients in the rank filtration of BOM. Unfortunately, my time for today is up now, but this is not the end of the story. 
I still owe you the application of the rank filtration to calculating the zeroth equivariant homotopy groups of MO as a global functor, and I still owe you this example of a naturally occurring morphism from MO to some other orthogonal spectrum that is a non-equivariant stable equivalence, but not a global equivalence. I will return to these points in the next lecture, and today I just thank you for your attention.